Check out award-winning Johnson & Boone Solicitor's unique product, Legal Guard. Ideal for businesses and individuals, Legal Guard ensures you get the legal help you need when you need it. Packages start from just £24 a month and include free expert advice, access to a library of legal documents, as well as exclusive discounts on a range of services. For more information, visit johnsonandboon.co.uk forward slash legal guard and quote the code for Chesh. You're listening to Johnson & Boon Solicitors podcast exclusively on the pod station. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Johnson & Boone podcast. My name is Mark, I'm your host. Uh, joining me again for the second time in 2021. I suspect this is because he's in lockdown and therefore has nothing better to do with his time uh, but to look at me over a computer screen. It is the wonderful Rob Boone from Johnson & Boone fame. How are we doing, Rob? Hi, Mark. How's it going? I'm not too bad. How are you coping working from home at the minute? Yeah, not bad at all. I think we're just about getting into our stride now. It's not quite the same as being in the office, but um, as you say, we're seeing lots of people over Zoom at the moment. If you are one of those people who would like to see Rob over Zoom, why not get in touch by visiting the Johnson & Boone website, which is johnsonandboone.co.uk. There's a contact page there. If you want to do it a bit more technologically advanced, then if you download the Johnson & Boone mobile app, you will find a tab where you can book an appointment with a member of the team whilst you're there or indeed whilst you're on the website have a mooch around on the podcast tab where you can actually find all of the previous episodes that we have done thus far um, if you go onto the website certainly you will find a link to all of the major podcast platforms where you can find the show if you press subscribe it mean it'll download automatically every time a new episode drops which saves you having to worry about it uh, we've also now gone on to the youtubes uh, so you can now actually listen to the whole of the episode on YouTube, which if that's your pre preferred method, then uh, we, we are catering for all, aren't we, Rob? We certainly are, Mark, yeah. So I guess, firstly, let's briefly explain, because this might be the first time someone's listening to these shows, what it is that we try and do with these episodes uh, and what the point of the podcast is, and then we can perhaps touch on what we're going to cover today. Yeah, sure, no problem. So the purpose of the podcast, we've been doing the podcast now for nearly a year, um, and the, the purpose of the podcast is just to give people a little insight into different issues, and some of them are current issues, and some of them are general issues, and we'll talk around the subject. Um, and the idea is to educate listeners, to help people with little tips here and there, um, and then also if they need any further help, then obviously we're there to expand upon that and they can book consultations. You'd think we'd be better if we'd been doing this for nearly a year, wouldn't you? <laughs> Silence speaks volumes, people. So, Rob, what is it that we're going to be covering today as the topic? So, firstly, just to um, to put a, um, a, a time stamp on this, we're currently right in the middle of the third national lockdown. Um, this week, we're talking about some of the issues that relate to uh, commercial tenancies. So we touched on commercial tenancies last week. This week, we're going to expand upon some of the issues that the commercial tenants are facing um, and what the limitations are at the moment for landlords when they're trying to deal with those issues. Fantastic. So when you say commercial tenants, what are we talking about? We're talking about the tenancies that relate to businesses. So a commercial lease on a shop, restaurant, office, anything really that a, a business operates from. Um, since the first national lockdown in March 2020, the financial impact of COVID-19 has been widespread uh, and many, many businesses have, have suffered hardship. Um, some sectors worse than others. So you'd be aware of the, the problems in retail and hospitality, uh, obviously the pubs, restaurants, places like that. The financial hardship is obviously having a knock-on impact on their ability to pay um, the rent that for due. Uh, and today we're going to expand upon, upon those problems uh, and where everyone is at the moment. 
So we're going to be talking about the businesses who have spent the last portion of 2020 either closed or if open, severely restricted. Yeah, that's right. So it's we're talking about businesses who uh, may have had to close or they'll have had restrictions in place that have only allowed them to uh, have a certain number of people in the premises. Maybe they can only serve things off 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 site. So a little bit like at the moment where takeaways are still going, but no one's allowed into restaurants themselves. As a result of the downturn in income, um, they've obviously they've suffered financially, but that doesn't mean that the obligations under their lease will have stopped. And many, many businesses are in a situation where they've now got substantial rent arrears that they're in negotiations with with the landlords. Recognising these difficulties, one of the provisions within the Coronavirus Act 2020 uh, was to, to put in place some limitations on landlords and some protections for the tenants that were struggling. And do we... Uh... I mean, I'm asking you the wrong person, really, but it doesn't appear as though there's going to be an enormous amount of financial aid and assistance sort of from this point leading up to when, and air quotes, I appreciate are relatively daft on a podcast, but when the normal returns to the economy. It doesn't appear so. Um, since Christmas, and, and I think just before Christmas, there was some further financial help for certain sectors. But I think very much we have to work on the basis now that the financial support that can be offered has has pretty much run out. The figures that have been handed out are huge. um, And obviously the economic effect of that is, is only yet to be seen in the future. So I think at the moment, businesses have to work on the basis that very little further financial help uh, will be coming, um, although obviously things like furlough are still in place at the moment, which remains to be helpful. Okay, so I mean, it, it doesn't sound particularly sunny and rosy, does it? In so far as if businesses have been struggling up to this point, and there isn't necessarily going to be a huge amount of assistance if they are one of these businesses that that has sort of fallen behind on their rent, they're going to have a, a, a difficult time. So, what type of protection? Did the coronavirus, the coronavirus Act offer to them initially? So under these uh, emergency rules, landlords were restricted in the steps that they were able to take and the remedies that they were able to seek against the, the, the tenants who fell into rent arrears um, as a result of the pandemic. Okay, so when did these come into place? So the restrictions were first in place in March 2020, um, uh, and they've been in since then. The government actually recently announced that they're going to be extended until the end of March uh, this year. So there is still some uh, some time for people to get things straight. Uh, but one of the things we're going to talk about today is what those restrictions actually mean um, and what it will mean when they run out. And is there any indications of whether the March 21 deadline is going to be extended? I appreciate that people these things keep on getting pushed back the longer that they go on. At the moment, vaccinations are undergoing, but it doesn't appear that that Joe blogs on the street, the likes of you and I who perhaps don't have any specific health issues and are of sort of a, well, for the benefit of the listeners, a relatively young age, we say with a wry smile. But we, we, we fall into that category where we, we're not the most at-risk people, are we? So they're thinking people like us aren't, certainly aren't going to get vaccinated till late spring, early summer, which feels like there's still going to be an awful lot of lockdown periods or risk of lockdown anyway until the likes of us are are injected. No, the, the, the government have indicated that it's likely that this will be a final extension and it provides a final opportunity for landlords and tenants to come to arrangements on any unpaid rent arrears over the next few months. So as of the 1st of April, if things stay as they currently stay, there will no longer be any legislative protection for tenants in these situations so if you think this might be applying to you guys it's now's the time to to not bury your head in the sand i think quite often when we discuss topics like this we we try to emphasize that as horrible as the stress and the the pressures that go with these situations are the worst thing you can do is try and ignore it because you don't want to have to deal with it yeah, that's absolutely right. At this moment in time, if, if any of this is relevant, then it's really important you're in communications with your landlords 
um, and you're putting a real effort into getting a, a payment plan in place or deciding what will happen moving forward to the benefit of all parties. So what are the landlords currently restricted from doing? Okay, so there's a few things for us to discuss. Um, first of all, and, and I suppose most importantly in the current situation, is that landlords are unable to forfeit a commercial lease, it's, um, even if the lease contains a forfeiture clause. Would this be something usually available? Yes, yeah, so usually if a tenant is in rent arrears for a defined a period of time, which would be set out in the lease, a landlord is able to take back the possession of the premises by obtaining a court order or in some instances instructing bailiffs to change the locks. What sort of timescales are usually applied for using this forfeiture and, and trying to get someone out? And I guess the question is here more, if the 31st of March is the date where this ceases to be a protection to tenants and they are potentially someone who might be vulnerable to a, a forfeiture, how long after that 31st of March deadline are they going to be looking at potentially finding themselves locked out of their premises if they can't reach an agreement or do something about it? It's going to very much depend upon the wording of their specific lease. So if people are worried about this, the, the best thing for them to do is to have an individual chat with us and we'll have a look at the lease. In most instances, it, it is going to be a, a period of time of a, at least a month or so. Um, but sometimes it is much shorter. So um, if people have got a specific concern, um, I, I'd recommend they get in touch. Okay, so what other protections do they currently enjoy or rather what restrictions are on landlords at the moment? So secondly, landlords are currently unable to use a procedure known as the commercial rent arrears recovery procedure. Uh, this is a procedure that allows landlords usually to enter premises and take control of tenants goods to cover the value of any rent arrears so in terms of time scales um it, and and seizing goods is this that they're owed money and they just come in and take the goods or is this they've got a court order saying that you owe x and they're sending someone in we won't go into that that's probably a 300 page recovery procedure that we could do in its own right uh, so it, it's a procedure for the landlord, and if they follow it, as long as they've ticked certain boxes and put certain notices in place, but there's a specific time frame for everything that needs to be done. And as long as they follow the procedure, they can literally just go in and seize goods too. And often they'll just instruct high court enforcement to go into the property and recover stuff. And it's a standalone procedure. It isn't really that often used. It's more used in things like uh, the production industry and, and industries where they can go in and switch everything off. You know where there's going to be an impact it isn't going to work in places where there's a load of computers second hand um, and they can't sell for a great value now that feels like a, a really draconian or quite a, an intimidating procedure to potentially have to face uh, it's obviously a, a very helpful protection for the tenants at the minute certainly it is it, it gives them a great peace of mind because it, it is a procedure that is used sometimes um, and it is a procedure that has um, an, an, a hugely negative effect on the business if, if items are seized so it, it's a useful tool um, but it, it, it you have to remember in all of this this is only buying the tenant a period of time and a lot of all of these things will run out shortly are there any other protections in addition to um, it sounds like I'm trying to weak them out of you really <laughs> Trying to give people hope, I think. <laughs> yeah, so there is another one. Um, there's one where landlords are unable to issue a statutory demand, uh, and this is usually done in accordance with the Insolvency Act. And a statutory demand is usually served on a tenant who owes at least £750 in arrears, and then a failure to receive a payment within a 21-day period would allow the landlord to, to then issue a winding up application. Now, obviously, a winding up application is extremely serious for the uh, the tenants and, and their business. So it is a great, um, it's a tool if a landlord wants to up the ante. Uh, and it is a good way of them receiving payments and, and forcing issues. But again, at this moment in time, that is something else which is, is paused. Is there anything in the Act that requires them to have a reasonable consideration of the circumstances so for example if the uh the rent is x but uh, well let's say the rent's a hundred pounds because my maths is shocking um and 
they've only been able to use the the property for 50 percent of the time and therefore they're arguing well can my rent not be 50 pound because i haven't been able to use the property for the full 100 pound period and whilst i appreciate it's not your fault as the landlord it's also not my fault that there's a a deadly virus um flying around obviously the landlord's argument will be well my bills are still exactly the same on this property so i kind of need you to still pay that 100 pound is that where this problem's ultimately going to find itself unresolvable because if the landlord's like well i can't really move from the hundred i'm sorry i sympathize with you but it is what it is and the tenant's like well i can't really pay more than 50 because i don't have a hundred because i've been shut 50 percent of the time where's where's that gap gonna be closed i think that's exactly right the problem is is that a, a lot of the tenants that have fallen into to, to arrears it is exactly because of the discussions that we've had today where the business has been severely impacted because of COVID, um, because of closures, because of a downturn in, in people just generally being about. And with a lot of people um, in, in other industries that have suffered financial hardship, maybe not even their own, there might be less money flying around in certain sectors anyway. So. I don't think that there's going to be a, a, a huge amount that the landlord is able to do in terms of reducing the rent arrears um, by offering reduced rents or anything like that. The lease is a contract. So when they've entered into the contract, they've agreed to pay a specific amount for a specific term. So there's nothing that allows them to bow out of that just because they're unable to use the property for a period because it isn't that they're unable to use the property because anything that the landlord has done one of the things that we we should move on to discuss is that whilst all these protections are in place the landlord's hands aren't completely tied and one of the things that the landlord is still able to do especially if they have a tenant who's being unrealistic or unreasonable in negotiations is they can still seek to recover rent arrears through the courts as a as a money claim now that isn't generally something which is favored by landlords because it can be a slow process. It requires them to incur costs and depending upon the value of it, um, it, it might not be something which, which is worth doing, but tenants do need to bear that in mind um, when they are entering into negotiations that their hands aren't completely tied. If there's any deposits, um, landlords are still able to, in certain circumstances, draw down from rent out of the deposits um and if there's any guarantors then again they can still pursue the guarantors so whilst the landlord is restricted in what they can do their hands aren't completely tied and i think th the main message that we're portraying today is that as time is slowly running out for tenants and these protections will slowly wither away it is important that there are agreements in place I suppose to, again, try and put a slightly more positive spin on everything, it's important for tenants to remember that that it's not in the landlord's interest for them to go out of business, is it? And sort of the court process, I mean, to take the example you've just given then of going through the court process, there's usually a point where if you admit the debt and one assumes there's very little ability to dispute the debt, um, that you can put forward a, a payment plan option and sometimes that can be something as bizarre as a pound a week for eternity and that's not going to do the landlord any good in terms of getting their money back it might mean that the landlords then can remove you from the property for the forfeiture element of it but again the question they've then got to ask themselves is is there going to be a big line of people waiting to fill that that office space once you get rid of this person because one assumes in the economic climate that we're probably likely to face because of the things you've just described and if you've got a, a unit that has been specifically designed for a restaurant you're going to kind of probably want another restaurant to come in or else someone's going to have to come and gut it if landlords are listening i think what i think i'm trying to say is uh, it's it's important that that negotiation does take place because what you want and what you get in the same way as the tenant, what you might want to be the case and what you ultimately get can't always be the same thing and that you might have to meet in that middle for the benefit of both of you, even if you both feel a bit fed up with that result. Yeah, I think you're right. In terms of, you know, what will the next year or so look like? 
I don't think anybody knows yet. And I don't think it will be straightforward for landlords to evict the current tenants to replace them as easily as maybe they once were. Uh, I think there's going to be less new businesses that are being set up for a period. If people have managed to weather the storm, then it might be they're not looking to expand. So that would be one of the reasons for acquiring new uh, new premises or, or maybe expand them by opening alternative branches of the same business. Um, so it is important, I think, for both parties that they remain amicable. Um, negotiation is really important, but also the tone of that negotiation is important because if, if both parties are able to, to maintain the relationship, move forward, a plan's put in place for the rent arrears to be paid off, then I think surely that's to the benefit of both. If you own rent arrears, I mean, is there any defence or is the so if your if your landlord ultimately decides that they don't want to um agree to the offer you're making or perhaps coming at it from a landlord's perspective your tenant just won't make an offer that's reasonable um is there anything that they've got to be aware of in terms of what the tenants might be able to come back with to say well i shouldn't have to pay you the full amount for x i think the biggest problem if we're talking about uh, landlords who decide to use the court process instead is that if the tenant has made a reasonable offer, whether the landlord deems it to be reasonable at the time, there can be cost consequences of starting proceedings. So if they if they sort of run off and issue proceedings and it's it's premature and it shouldn't have been done, then they're going to incur perhaps substantial fees depending on how they do it. And there's no necessary certainty that the courts are going to reward those fees later on. So if it costs them as much as they're trying to achieve, um, that is is not going to be helpful. Obviously, you'll recall from earlier episodes when we've discussed the content of leases, there is often clauses that require a tenant to pay any legal fees that a landlord incurs in having to do these things and, and recover amounts from them. So it will be very case sensitive. And in some, in some instances, the court hands will be more tied. But generally speaking, I don't think anybody has, has done particularly well from situations where rent, it can't be paid over the last you know, nine or 12 months, you're going to have a landlord who's perhaps out of pocket because the rent hasn't been paid. And you're going to have a tenant who's out of pocket already because the business hasn't um, been as active as it normally would. So litigation should be an absolute last resort because neither party should want to invest in either bringing proceedings or defending proceedings. And you and I have spent many a year advising people about the recovery of debts because one of the major uh, factors you have to consider is are you going to get the money back? You might get the court order that says you are owed X, but the question is, do they have the money to pay you? If if your tenant's saying, I don't have the money to pay my rent, uh, sticking a load of legal costs on top of that is only going to mean they owe you more money that they already can't pay and you're left having to foot the bill for the legal um, the legal fees until such time as, as you can get it back off them, which might actually be never because they might go out of business. You're right. I mean, in terms of um, a judgment, you know, if a landlord gets as far as getting a judgment from a tenant, a judgment, if it isn't paid, is an expensive piece of paper that hasn't really taken them anywhere. It might cause the tenant some, some further difficulties, depending on whether they're a company or depending on whether um, the tenant's an individual, so they're a sole trader. Um, but one of the things that I think, we, again, we've discussed in, pre in previous episodes is that before any litigation is, any brought, is ever brought against any party, it's important to ascertain whether that party is gonna be able to pay the sums that you're trying to get. Regrettably, in the current climate, there will be companies that are in an insolvency situation. They might already have huge debt lists of, of other things that they owe. And just by obtaining a judgment, the landlord might not necessarily jump to the top of that, nor does it mean they'll get paid. At the same time, a tenant who might have been able to dig their way out of that over time, it might force them into an insolvency situation. And where you might have had a landlord that would have been paid over a period of time, they may end up not being paid. So again, the, the message has to be that there is no merit here in, in anything other than negotiation. Obviously, if one party is going to be completely unreasonable and they're not going to enter into negotiations, then the court would then be the only recourse. But um, 
as as we've repeated, um, litigation is unlikely to add much to this situation, which is already quite bad. And I suppose I would add to that that when you say if you feel the other person's being unreasonable the definition of unreasonable is very subjective if you're in the midst of a very stressful situation if for example you're a tenant your business is really struggling um because of uh, this pandemic you're struggling to meet your bills you know your, your pressures at home of paying your bills i can understand why people will be so emotionally wound up their mental health might not be great and so their perception of the way that the landlord is reacting might be that they're being unreasonable. Whereas if you, if if in the cold light of day, without all of those added pressures, you looked at it in a sub in, in a in a, a non emotional manner, actually they might not be as unreasonable. In those kind of instances, is that something where the likes of you guys and the Johnson and Boom, Boom team would be really coming to your own? Where if it gets to the stage where you feel like they're being unreasonable, but you you need to run it past someone to make sure that you're not just being hypersensitive to it or ultra defensive because of the circumstances you find yourself in. Instructing the solicitor is generally perceived that you're going to war, but in this case, could it actually be used to avoid war? Absolutely. So one of the um, one of the processes that we've put in place and, and one of the services that we can offer is whether it be a landlord or whether it be a tenant we can conduct an assessment of the situation that is normally done at a, an initial consultation where we can have site and lease. Um, we can discuss through all of the issues, any negotiations that have taken place so far, and we can advise from a, a stand and back situation what a reasonable outcome would be. And then we can either leave the parties to it if they feel that they are still in a position where they can negotiate themselves, or we can, uh, we can take over negotiations for one party Obviously, we can't act for both parties because there would be a, a conflict of interests. Um, but rather than allowing it get to a situation where a fallen out exercise takes place, um, an initial consultation so we can discuss through what's happened and realistically where people are, or if there's any misunderstanding in relation to maybe any of the clauses of the lease, maybe they're not sure out of the things we've discussed today, for example, what the forfeiture clauses would be when it kicks back in. Um, in, in at the start of April, then we can go through all that with them. We can have a consultation uh, and then they can take it from there. Fantastic. Highly recommend doing that. If you find yourselves in a position where you've just fallen out with each other because you can't agree, don't go straight for the court process because based on all of the things we've discussed today, I think there's probably very little benefit. There will be the odd case, won't there, Rob, where... It, there is no other option but for landlords to repossess the properties and uh, come the end of March and for legal proceedings to be started, but it should absolutely be used as a last resort in this case. It should. And, you know, the courts are there as a, a place of last resort. So, you know, if, if a matter ends up before a judge to make a determination, that should be a, a failed negotiation in most circumstances. But especially in, in this sort of situation, this is definitely something that can be resolved between the parties um, and there's no reason really that the parties should end up investing the time or indeed the money that the court proceedings require. How can they get in touch if they do need some advice? All of the usual ways. So they can contact us on any of our social media platforms, uh, one on all of the usual spaces. They can go onto our website and drop us a message via the message tab. Um, they can call our office on 0151 637 2034 or they can drop us an email to info at johnsonandburn.co.uk. Um, a member of our team will pick that up uh, and then a relevant person will get in touch and, and we'll book in a consultation for you. It costs nothing to uh, get in contact, people. It's well worth doing and it's worth the consultation, definitely, if you find yourself in that situation. Um, well, hopefully that has been of use. Hopefully we haven't left any tenants who are in this position feeling too depressed and hopefully we haven't left any landlords who are experiencing the other side of the coin and 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 struggling with uh, tenants not paying the bills which can be equally as damaging if if they've got mortgages on those premises and the like it's 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 not a one way thing is this no it absolutely isn't I, I i think everybody's in this together 
I think, you know, obviously some businesses have suffered more than others. Um, but I think it's just important that rather than allowing things to move towards the April deadline, the whole point of today is for people who don't realise maybe that these restrictions are running out. So they might have seen these restrictions are in place. They may have seen one extension, two extensions of, of the rules being pushed back. Um, this really is just an outline of what those restrictions are um, and the heads up really that we think it is all going to end in April. And landlords and tenants can get in touch with you. You do specialise in dealing with both sides. Yes, we do. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, hopefully you found that of use, guys. Rob, thank you very much for your expertise as always. Thanks, Mark. It's been a pleasure as always. And thank you very much for listening, guys. We'll catch you next time. Get social at Johnson & Boone on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.